redemption story. And some sweet day, I'll sing up there the song of victory.
We come to see more clearly God's presence in our lives, and we cry, Surely God is in this place. We come to see God in community, both far and near, and we hold fast to the promise, Surely God is in this place. We come to pray, to praise, and to offer ourselves to God, and we exclaim, Surely God is in this place. Come, let us now worship. You may be seated at this time. I welcome you into the sanctuary as we worship as a community of faith, and I welcome those of you who are worshiping with us from your own faces to this community of faith where we are praising, we are thanking God, we are lifting God's name on high, and we are worshiping with all that we have today. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you. We thank you for speaking to us through the prophets and the apostles, that we might know you and love you with our whole hearts. Thank you for sending us your spirit, the spirit of truth, that we might discern truth from falsehood and remain true to your word. Forgive us our battle-scarred, hardened hearts that we would not become like the enemies of truth. Forgive us for being so focused on judgment for our enemies that we no longer pray for their conversion or that we no longer see our own sin. Teach us how to love our enemies, that we might overcome evil with good. Give us your strength in our weakness, that we might have the courage to face our troubles and tribulations. Direct our thoughts, our words, our actions today, that we may know and do your will. We pray that your wisdom be our guide that we might ever walk in the newness of life. We pray this all for your name's sake, and all of God's people said, Amen. Our scripture reading today comes again from the book of Revelation. We are in the midst of a five-week series as we explore the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I invite you to listen today, to turn in your Bibles to chapter 2 of Revelation. Revelation is the last book in the Bible. Chapter 2, and we are reading chapter 2 and 3 today. This is John's address directly to the seven churches in Asia Minor. But remember last week we said God has a message for us even in the midst of a letter that was written to other churches. So hear these words now. To the angel, to the angel of the church and to Jesus, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles, but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently, and beaming up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen, repent and do the works that you did at first. If not, I will come to you and I will remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has the ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God.
And to the angel of the church of Laodicea, the words of the the words of the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works; you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say I am rich, that I have prospered, and I need nothing. You do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. And white robes to clothe you, keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen, and self to note your eyes so that you may see. I reprove and discipline those who I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I'm standing at the door, I'm knocking, I'm knocking. If you hear my voice, open the door. I will come in to you, eat with you, and eat with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne, just as I, my, just as I myself conquered and sat down with the Father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. This is the word of God for the people of God. I have a question for you, because you know I always have to start off with a question, right? So have you ever done pain promises? Have you? Were you doing pain promises? Do you promise to read your Bible? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you're honest about it. Today, in the scripture reading, it was a long scripture reading, right? Today, it was longer than what we normally have. And there was a lot of interesting images in it that maybe we don't understand. But there's one that kind of struck me as interesting, and I thought it might be interesting to you too. It said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, only, known only to him who receives it. So have you ever played with rocks? Have you ever played with rocks? Turn rocks? Dove in rocks? Have you ever found a white rock? Have? Are, they, are there a lot of white rocks around here? Not really. So what, what this is saying is that a long, well actually I want to kind of tell you why having a white rock is important, right? Because we've got lots of kinds of rocks. But a long time ago, when a Roman gladiator, so that was uh, like a Roman soldier, right, um, was especially brave and he had fought a good fight, he was given a white stone with special letters on it. And when that stone was given to the gladiator, it allowed him to retire so he didn't have to fight anymore. It was kind of his ticket to rest. 
so he wouldn't have to risk his life. So it was a great reward, kind of like how we talked about trophies before. The, the, the stone was a great reward. So when we know that, and we know that the prophet John is saying that Jesus has been revealed, and in that revealing, I will give him a white stone with a new name. So we will get a, a white stone with a new name on it. Well, for us, a white stone is in a pile of stones, right? But for the people of that day, gave a white stone with their name on it or special letters on it was a great reward. So our scripture today is about the promises that Jesus makes for us. So, do you think you promise? Will you promise to at least read the Bible story once a week? Can you do that? One time? <laughs> Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being always true to your promises. Thank you for redeeming us, for loving us, and for always being with us. Amen. Thanks, Brady. So last week, when we began our series on the revelation of Jesus Christ, we began it by establishing a lens in which to read or hear the message of God that was given to the prophet John. And we began by recognizing that, as commentator Eugene Boring suggests, that this letter does indeed have a message for our time, but it doesn't make predictions about it. So we are exploring what that message may be for us today. In our scripture reading today, we hear seven times the exhortation, let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Seven times we heard this. Now, while it was captured in the delivery to each of the seven churches. Remember, this letter went to all of the churches, so they were reading everything, so they were learning from each other as part of a body, a community of believers, even though they were in different geographic locations. So let us today, even though we are in a different geographic location and a different time, let us listen to what the Spirit is saying. With this pastoral letter of prophecy that John has written to all seven churches, we are provided with a window into the life of the first century church in Asia as a whole, as well as specifics about each community of faith. We hear a mixture of faith and unfaith, of responsibility and irresponsibility, which always characterizes the church in this world. Christ's followers are addressed not as individuals striving for perfection, but corporately as members of communities of faith, of Christian faith, of Christian mi mission, and Christian witness. You see, there is a pattern to these addresses. We hear commendations, the things that the churches are doing well, we hear condemnation, the areas where they've fallen short. We hear exhortations, here's what you need to do. And finally, we hear a promise. So let us examine the exhortations. As we look at what has been said to each of the churches, you're going to see a thread that, that is pulled through all of the different churches. In Ephesus, it was repent and do the works you did at first. In Smyrna, be faithful and resist temptation. Pergamon, it was repent. Thyatira was repent, hold fast, resist temptation. 
In Sardis, remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. To the church at Philadelphia, it was hold fast to what you have so no one may seize your crown. Hold fast. Resist temptation. To the church at Laodicea, be earnest, therefore, and repent. Are you following the thread? It didn't matter the location. It didn't matter how big or how small the community of faith was. They were being given an exhortation to do. This is what they needed to do. There is a message for us today in the exhortations that John gives to the churches in Asia. And that message is to repent of our sins. And it's also to resist the temptation to sin. So how do we, as a church, repent? How do we resist temptation? Well, you know I like alliteration, so I've got seven R's of repentance. The first is that we need to recognize it. We need to acknowledge that we sin. That not only do we sin as individuals, but corporately, as a church, we have sinned. There is a church hurt that has happened over the years. We need to recognize it. We need to acknowledge it. And then there's remorse. That's regret and grieving of it. It's our hearts, the state of our hearts, Grieving the hurt that we have caused. Resolve. It's not enough to just recognize it and regret it. We actually need to decide to change the hurtful behavior, the sinful behavior. And again, we come back to that confession, that, that, that confession is part of repenting. We confess our sins. And recently, I've had a lot of conversation with different folks about is confession just between me and God? Well, part of being a community of faith is that we hold each other accountable. So in confessing our sins to one another and to God, we are held accountable for our behavior. Reform means we don't do it anymore. We don't just say we're sorry and then keep sinning, right? We actually are sorry. We actually have remorse. We actually change, decide to change our behavior, and then we actually do it. And then there's restoration, where we need to make amends for the sins and the hurt that we have caused. And then there's the relief where forgiveness is offered and forgiveness is received. So repentance is a complex thing. It's not simply enough to just say, I'm sorry. Repentance is a complete turning away from sin and turning back to God, both as an individual but also corporately as a church. So John was saying we needed to repent, but we also need to resist temptation. So how do we do that? We pray it, right? In the Lord's Prayer every Sunday, we pray, for, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So we risk, resist temptation by praying as Jesus indeed taught us to pray. Jesus told the disciples to watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. So at the very basic level, we need to pray every day to resist temptation. Apart from God, we have no hope of resisting temptation. We are not strong enough to resist temptation on our own. We also need to learn to recognize what, what is temptation, right? Because temptation is one of those things that 
You can get into it. You can be in it before you even know what it is. So what is it that you desire? What is it that pulls at you? What is it that pulls you from the righteous ways of God? We need to learn to recognize temptation before it leads us to sin. And then when we recognize temptation, we need to flee from it. Don't put yourself in a situation where you will come into whatever it is that tempts you. That's a dangerous game to play. We must turn away and avoid the things that tempt us. In the Apostle Paul's letter to the Ephesians, so you see John was writing to the church at Ephesus as well, and the Apostle Paul had written to the church at Ephesus. And in Paul's letter, he describes God's word as the sword of the spirit. Arm yourself for battle against temptation by being in God's word. So that means we need to study the word. We need to be in it. We need to know it so that we can battle temptation. We can battle what it is that the devil throws at us. And we need to rest. We need to practice Sabbath. When we are tired, when we are exhausted, we are much more susceptible to temptation. God calls us to rest and renewal through the practice of Sabbath. Through resting and remembering who God is Recognizing what it is that God is doing, has done, and continues to do in your life. Sabbath is a discipline that we practice. So these are the exhortations, right? To repent and to resist temptation. But then each address that the prophet John gave to the churches concludes with a promise, a promise of blessing expressed in end times terms, using language that paints a picture of redemption, of salvation, of life eternal, victorious with Jesus Christ. Each promise is addressed to the community of faith with language that uses conquer, well, your translation may say victorious or overcomer. They're all about being victor, victorious and having victory in Jesus. To the church at Ephesus, he wrote, To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. That's the redemption story that is that is renewing us, it is putting us back into a right relationship with God that God created before the fall. To the church at Smyrna, he says, whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. At Pergamon, to whoever conquers, to everyone who conquers, I will give some of his manna, and I will give a white stone, and on that stone, will be written a new name. We become new. To Thyatira, to everyone who conquers and continues to do my work to the end, I give authority over the nations to rule them with an iron rod, and when clay pots are shattered, even as I also received authority from my father. We are to be with Christ in that spiritual, with that spiritual authority. To Sardis, you will be clothed like them in white robes. I will not blot your name out of the book of life. I will confess your name before my Father and before his angels. The book of life, this is eternal life with God. To Philadelphia, I will make you a pillar in the temple of my God. 
I will write you on the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem that comes down from my God out of heaven and on my own new name. New life, new, newness, renewal, a second birth. To Laodicea, to the one who conquers, I will give my place, give a place with me on the throne, just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. This is all about victory in Jesus. Conquering, winning the victory is a key word in John's revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's also key in understanding our Christian life. The Christian life called for in these addresses is not an adherence to moralistic norms. It's not just following the law. But it is a life lived in view of the reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ in the past and the ultimate victory of God over sin and death in the final days of judgment. The seven churches of Revelation were reminded of the promises of victory through Jesus. They were challenged to listen to the Holy Spirit. They were challenged to hold on to those promises no matter the difficulties they faced. And just like the churches in Revelation, we as believers and as the church are called to listen to the Holy Spirit. We are called to listen to the Holy Spirit for counsel, for encouragement, and yes, correction as we go about our daily lives. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Let us pray. Holy and sovereign God, your word states The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness. By your grace, empower us to reject sin. You know our hearts. There is nothing we can hide from you. Illumine us our transgressions, for we know we have strayed from the path of true righteousness. Shine a light on our sins so we can no longer hide behind self-righteousness. For these, we are sorry. Forgive us as we pray with repentant hearts. Restore us to the joy of your salvation. Fill us with your spirit and remind us that we are a new creation in Christ. Although we once walked in sin and darkness by your victory won on the cross, we are no longer bound to walk in those former ways. Amen. You are invited to sit and reflect on the hymn of promise, or you can turn to number 707 in the hymnal and join in singing along with us.
you're invited to turn to number 887 in our hymnal and stand as we, as a community of faith, together recite an affirmation of faith that is found, that comes from the Book of Romans. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? No. no. In, In all, all things, we are more than conquerors through the one who loves us. We are sure neither death, death, nor life, nor, life, nor, nor angels, angels, nor principalities, nor, nor things present, present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you, God. We move into a time of joyful and generous giving. And you are invited to place your offering in the box at the back of the church at this time. And for those of you that are worshiping with us from home, you may mail in your offering or give electronically through our website. As we grow in discipleship and following Jesus and in our faith, we also grow in the giving of our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. Let us pray. Great and glorious Savior, we listen attentively to your voice. We place our trust in your truth and grace. We generously give in gratitude for your truth in our spiritual journey. We pray that these monetary gifts may help others to see your kingdom, to draw closer to you, and to find ultimate peace. We pray in the name of the one who sustains us throughout life's journey, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Amen. May stand as our offering is brought forward and sing the gospel. those in need and bring hope to those who are empty. In 
Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. This is our time to lift to God and to pray as a community of faith, interceding for those who are in need of prayer. We lift to God the joys, and we lift to God the concerns. I share with you today several concerns that have come in this week, so please pray with me. For the Fort Hill High School community, the children, the teachers, the administrators, we lift to God Ashland Slope and Baby Slope. There was good news from Bonagram, and we're excitedly waiting and anticipating the birth of this child. We lift up Brenda Van and three of Brenda's fam uh, friends, Jan, Wendy, and Pat. We lift up Bill and Dottie Mosier, Marcy Ross, who is recovering from surgery, and Jay-Z and Bill, Jay-Z Fisher and Bill Minnick, who are also recovering from surgery. What are our other prayer requests that we need to lift today? Dolores and Louis Rollins. Dolores and Louis Rollins. We also need to keep Lynn Douglas in our prayers. I spent some time on the phone with Holly yesterday, and she had posted on Thursday the amazing progress that Lynn was making. And then on Friday, he had a significant setback. So while he is better than he was when he got to Harrisburg, there has been a setback. So this is that roller coaster of recovery. So please keep Lynn in your prayers. Please keep Diane and Michael and Jenny and Holly and Jason and their children in prayer because Lynn's got a big battle ahead. But we know God is healing. We know God is with Lynn. We know God is with Lynn's family. Other prayers? Oh God, we are humbled. We are humbled by the many blessings that you have bestowed, the promises that you have made. We are humbled and we turn to you, God, lifting before you those that we have named for healing, be it in mind, body, or spirit. We lift to you those that need to feel your loving arms wrapped around them. And we know that you know them. You know every hair on their head. You call them by name. We pray, God, for the unspoken requests, the ones that are weighing so heavily on our hearts. Give us courage, God, to lean on this community of faith to surround us, to uphold us, to hold us accountable. God, we pray for your church, your church universal, that we may be the church you have created us to be. We pray, God, for your creation, for the world, that it too may be restored fully and completely. We pray, God, in the words that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us 
us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We have several announcements today. All Saints Day is going to be here before we know it. Um, in fact, it is next Sunday. <laughs> so it is right around the corner. As is our tradition, we list those that have gone on to glory in the last year. And we celebrate the new life that has been born in the last year. So if you have a loved one that has either moved on to glory or has been born this year, please give us that information so that we can list them next Sunday. There is um, a slip in the Welcome Center where you can drop that information in a wooden box out there, or you can call the church office and let Karen know. We're still in need of prayer buddies for our Good Shepherd Little, so um, there's still a sign-up sheet out in the in the Welcome Center, and we are getting those names and the permissions from the parents and all of that done. My hope is to kick that off right around Thanksgiving, so um, we still need some more prayer buddies. And then today, after worship, we are gathering in the upper room to... Um, work on our nativity sets that we are gifting to the children. So um, if you can glue, we've got glue sticks, if you can glue, take, put glue on a piece of paper and slap it on a rock, you can work with us this afternoon, right after worship. So um, we invite you to come upstairs and, and help. We've got 540 rocks that we're, we're, we're gluing today. Uh, a reminder that the shoeboxes are due November 4th. I see, see that we've got a few that have been turned in. If, you, if you've got your boxes packed, they can come in and be put on the, the circular um, table in the Welcome Center. And we'll bring them in on the 14th and we will pray and pray for the children who receive them and bless the giver who is, is giving. So with that, um, I invite you to stand as we close our worship with majesty.
go, go now to spread the good news, to be God's light in the world, and to be God's kingdom here on earth. Be that example. Show others what that looks like. Go now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.